Well, this is going to wrap it up, and then I'll do a summary for you. And let me just run through domains one for you. Domains one. Ha! Huh. These are all your cheap six-point possibilities. I can't tell you what's on the test, because I don't know. Uh, anyway, what you need to do is focus your attention on standardized assessments, of course, and be able to discuss the relative benefits and detriments of standardized assessments. And you know that the benefits of them are that they are objective. Yes, they are. They are going to measure a main idea, or they will measure the ability of a child to pick out a supporting detail or a conclusion, or whatever it happens to be after reading a passage and answering multiple choice questions. Another benefit is that they allow, of course, group comparisons. Indeed, you can compare group to group, child to uh, group, district to district, state to state, country to country, etc. And one of the things that I brought up earlier when I did one of my podcasts was on um, assessment. And this leads in kind of to the detriment, in a way, that when you do those comparisons, sometimes the comparisons are unfair Nobody called me on this. I, I can't believe it. I had mentioned that uh, when we look at the 50 states, for example, and compare them to other countries, that the, my great state of Minnesota ranks right up at the top, and unfortunately California ranks somewhere at the bottom when we line it up with uh, uh, other countries. For example, Minnesota's topping out right among Norway and some of the other countries that spend a lot on education, like other Asian countries where California ranks out at the bottom, no one called me on it. I mean, you know, I was expecting you guys to bring it up that if you disaggregate further and look at school districts within Minnesota and compare them with school districts within um, California, places like Palo Alto and other places on the coast, they beat everybody. They trounce Minnesota. That's for sure. And that all has to do with the amount of money and parental uh, education level and so forth. So one detriment of uh, a standardized test is that while it does allow for those comparisons, when you disaggregate data, you can get really, really different results. And so I'm kind of shocked you guys didn't bring that up. It must be my Minnesota education. Or maybe you're polite. I don't know. So anyway, I'm not. The other uh, problem with standardized tests, as you know, is that um, you might be measuring the kid's stomach ache that day, not their ability to find a main idea. And a final detriment that you could cite is the fact that um, they don't show they don't show process. For example, you know that the child can't divide, but you don't, don't you don't know why. Was it because they didn't line up their decimals correctly? They didn't carry the one? You have no idea. So enter the portfolio. You may have the opportunity to write on portfolios if asked questions about formal and informal assessments. And portfolios were meant and still are meant to fill in that gap. You do see process. You see how children arrive at answers. You see growth over time in the four skills of listening, reading, writing, and speaking, for example. And you can document all of it. You can document growth. You see process. You see growth over time. Uh, where they tend to be limited, limited is in their ability to make adequate comparisons. You have one portfolio that's thin because one child's you know, family was in some sort of a crisis and another ch child's portfolio is really thick but not very good. Well, how do you compare the two? I mean, there's so many uh, intervening variables that they come off as quite subjective if the criteria are not clear. So make sure that you're able to distinguish between benefits and detriments of both standardized tests and portfolios. Selecting literature. Um, for selecting literature, just make sure that you do some common things for whatever grade levels you're discussing. Make sure that you survey the student interests so you got good, interesting books for everybody in the class. Make sure that they're multicultural. Make sure that they're free of uh, gender and ethnic uh, bias. For kindergarten through third grade, please be sure that you're picking decodable books and sight word books and picture books for English language learners and everybody else who needs help with reading. And uh, for four to eight, pick things that have more challenging themes and that are going to be more tailored toward uh, and skewed toward comprehension rather than just pure decoding. Classroom planning, we did that essay in class. It's extremely simple. Um, just build your centers around the four skills of uh, reading, and writing and listening and speaking. So you can just imagine dividing up the room into four corners and uh, you'll have a reading center, writing center, listening center, and a speaking center. Indeed. Let me scroll this up just a bit. 
Something else that will be helpful for you to know uh, will be the difference between like homogeneous grouping and heterogeneous grouping. Well, for homogeneous grouping, if you look at the, you know, if we did a little structural analysis, homo, as you know, means same. And so you're going to do ability grouping for kids who have the same need. For example, if we look at this data set for decoding blends, you can see that Timmy is struggling, Jimmy is struggling, Johnny is struggling, and Billy is struggling. So ability group those kids together, do teacher-dominated activities to get them up to speed. However, for heterogeneous grouping, hetero meaning mixed, you know, mixed ability, you're going to uh, group them any way you want. You know, you'll have a group of three here, a group of three here, four, and then another group of three or four here. And the important thing to note for heterogeneous grouping is that it's mainly to build community. It's mainly to build camaraderie. It's for harmless things like brainstorming ideas or um, scaffolding instruction or scaffolding knowledge where the children sort of work together and, and have a common discourse and support one another and so forth. The other things to keep in mind for heterogeneous grouping is that you may want to assign roles to students. You can have a, a reader, a writer, a drawer, if there's such a word, and then a speaker or something like that. But you, all, you also have to give them all um, assigned uh, tasks and build in homework for the kids who finish early and, and things like that. So that's the difference between an ability group and then a brainstorming group or a homogeneous group versus heterogeneous. Going down to building fluency, just keep in mind that what I'm intending in this example question is that you've got a child who can decode words in isolation, be they decodable words or sight words, but when you put it all together they're just slow and they do so without any intonation, kind of like the way I speak in that Minnesota monotone of mine. And Basically, what you will do for a slow rate is repeated reading. Get an independent level book that's familiar and have them read it, read it, read it, read it until their speed improves over time. For intonation, you've got two different choices. You can do a choral read. When you do a choral read, that will involve modeling, and then they uh, echo back, and then they do it by themselves, and they do it expressively, uh, etc. You can also do books on tape for that. That's another effective thing. All right, well, that takes care of these cheap six-pointers for domain one that I think would be important for you to know. Well, we'll see. Let's go on to domain four, and domain four is equally easy and equally fast. Motivating children. Here you have a child who can read, won't read. What do you do? Well, it's easy. First, set goals. you got to set goals for this kid. Two, you got to have definable goals. What's that mean? It means setting page counts. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you want the child to read at least five pages. For the rest of the week, seven pages. Next week, ten pages. Next week, fifteen, etc. And you'll chart his progress. That would be step three. Charting his progress. Four, you need to have goals and rewards, and he gets to pick something out of the prize box based on the number of stars that he gets on his chart for completing his assigned readings. And then you should also survey his interests, because maybe you just don't have stuff that he wants to read. And so you better find out everything you can about the child to figure out why they're not reading. Maybe you just don't have interesting stuff. If you get hit with anything related to reader's theater, understand how to do it in steps. If you're asked, like, how would you do it? Well, you've got to create a script. See that in here. You've got to model the script. You see that in blue. You've got to assign the roles. The kids have to practice the roles and read the script 12 times and perform it. And then they perform it before... Um, without any p costumes or props before students, faculty members, etc. Now, why do you do it? Well, look, if you model expressive reading, you're working on one aspect of fluency. Yes, you are. You are working on expression and intonation. If you have them do repeated reading of this thing 12 times, well, repeated reading is for speed, so you're trying to get them to be speedy. The last thing, when you have them perform it, that's going to target comprehension. They get to display what they understand and... Um, there you go. So it hits uh, both aspects of fluency, expression and um, speed, along with uh, the corresponding byproduct, comprehension. Language experience approach. That's extremely easy. Um, this was right out of the Chris case study. And out of that Chris case study, here we have a child who uh, has visited the zoo, and now we want to know what we can do when they get back. Well, just do um, language experience, where you elicit a story first. So let me write that in here. You will elicit a story. In other words, what you see at the zoo. 
After you elicit the story, either you or the child writes it, typically the child. After they write it, they read it, usually doing some kind of uh, finger pointing, and then after that you can fix it. Why do you do this? It works on concepts about print. It works on letter sound correspondence. It may even work on onsets and rhymes. Another thing that it does is it connects, ex it connects experience with written expression. It, so it's going to connect experience and print. That they understand that what you experience, you can write. What you write, you can read. What you read, you can say. What you say, you can write. All of those things are interrelated. L um, for English language learners, if you get to anything related to TPR, just understand that that's for total physical response. That's the T, the P, and the R. Total physical response. And total physical response is going to connect like concrete actions and concrete nouns. Just think of Simon Says. Touch your hair, touch your toes. You are able to model these actions concretely and model the nouns um, that you're having the child uh, find. What you're really doing is attaching spoken labels to concrete objects and concrete actions. That was spoken labels to concrete actions and objects. Another related type of uh, activity, it's not really multisensory so much, nor is it total physical response, but it is environmental, and that says environmental, kids, environmental print. Environmental print. You label everything in the room, the desk, the floor, the ceiling, etc. You do so because you're trying to connect a, an object with its printed label. You're trying to connect an object and its printed label. And to do that, you do, the, do so through labeling and modeling and speaking and everything else. The last term I'd like to throw on the screen is just realia. And those are just concrete objects used to teach language. You know, if you're going to be teaching abstract things like sweet and sour, um, hopefully you'll have a lemon and sugar on hand because it's going to be a struggle to explain the concept of sweet and sour. Might work if the languages are related, like English and any Romance language, Romance being um, a Romanesque language like French, for example, Portuguese, or Spanish, or something like that. But um, if you're not a proficient uh, Tagalog speaker, um, even if you have the English to Tagalog dictionary in front of you, might be easier for you just to grab a lemon and some sugar to teach the concepts, don't you think? All right, well, that wraps that up. These are your six-point questions for domains one and four, the possibilities that I think are important. We'll see if they are. I have no idea. I think what I should do is go through the next case study with you. I wasn't going to do it, but let me do it quickly because I want you to um, be able to handle the golden child. And the golden child is a kid who has only strengths and no weaknesses. This is uh, Beatrice, and Beatrice has... Uh, well, we got to find our strengths and needs. We got to do two lesson plans, and then we got to do two benefits. Well, what I intended for this one is that um, on this data set, which is narrative text, she's perfect. There are no weaknesses at all in her comprehension of narrative text. So I'll put a little exclamation point here with a stupid little happy face. So she's perfect at it. When we go to the expository and you read it, once again, you see that she is perfect. Absolutely no problems with expository. We go through her uh, word identification. Everything is great. And you guys want to kill me now because you can't find any weaknesses. And the same thing on her word analysis. We'll put a giant happy face here. She's great. So the question then is, what do you do for a child like uh, Beatrice? Well, let me, let me try to find some uh, blank paper to write on. And I'll do that right in here. Look, it is so simple. You got paragraph one, you got paragraph two, you got paragraph three, A and B, paragraph number four, and paragraph number five. Here's how I would handle it. Paragraph number one is going to be perfect narrative text comprehension. You can even throw in vocabulary too if you wanted from that word recognition check. You have perfect expository. If you look at her, uh, the last page of her, her data, everything was outstanding. and It was wonderful uh, on the vocabulary like roots and affixes and everything else. You can throw that in there too. Well, number three then, it's not a weakness that you're going to work on. And, and instead, you must extend her understanding.
of narrative and expository. For example, A and B. A in this case, if we're going to do a departure off of narrative text, well, let's do a character study. And for B, for perfect expository, let's do a research project. And let's have the character study be writing. And let's have the research project be some kind of oral report, a speech that you'll have to do. Well, the processes for both of these are, are the same. So for the lesson plan and four, my goodness, this is really simple. You have to do this type of a process. You have to do brainstorming. So she's going to brainstorm a topic related to the character study. Then she's going to do a draft, which means that she's going to have like a focus question or something like that. After she does a draft, she's going to edit. Edit ideas, meaning that she's going to expand some ideas and contract some ideas, etc. And after she edits, then what you have to do is revise. You revise grammar, you revise style. Notice the position of revision. That doesn't come until like step four. And then the last thing she does is she publishes. For her research project resulting in a speech, there has to be the same few steps. There will have to be BSing, there will have to be drafting. There will have to be editing. But then she's got to do like practice presentation. She must practice. After she practices, then she presents. So if you get the golden child on the test, then just do the next thing that ought to be done with a student and try to target different skills. Do like writing and, and speaking, as you see right here. It's the easiest thing in the world. Okay, the last installment, I'll just sum up and tell you uh, what I would focus on and study for the test, okay? I'm out of here in uh, seconds. Bye.